The Kinsey Collection is the largest private holding of African-American art and artifacts. The family show has traveled the world and some say was the blueprint for the Smithsonian National Museum of African-American History and Culture. We caught up with them in Houston at their latest exhibition to discuss how it all began and the importance of knowing your history. Inside Houston's Holocaust Museum, America's fight against Nazi Germany is getting a second look. Here we have African-American troops liberating concentration camps. You never heard that before. This history is being shared through the lens of a family hoping to right the record. The myth of absence is operating at so many levels in the Kinsey Collection, and we, we believe when you come through here, you see a different side of this whole story. For husband and wife Bernard and Shirley Kinsey. These paintings hanging on the wall are some of my favorites because... And their son Khalil. The whole story covers far more than World War II. This is a marriage record for a young girl named Estebana known as the earliest known black baptismal record in American history. Documents from the 1590s of free black people who settled with the Spanish in St. Augustine, Florida. How do you know they're black? Uh, it actually states that in the, in the transcription. Oh, wow. Yeah. And other artifacts and artistry, sculptures, paintings, murals. These are doors. Where are they from? From the Cape Coast Castle in Ghana. Four and a half million people went through these doors. Giving context to an era many have tried to forget. One of the most profitable business in the history of the world was taking people. I mean, in 1850, people were more valuable than land. Land in Florida was two cents an acre and a person was $500. So do the math. And greater understanding for our common connection. We are in the Holocaust Museum. I think some people might wonder, what is the connect? Mm -hmm. we, we view American slavery as a Holocaust as well. One that was studied by Adolf Hitler. There is no disconnect if we look at this from a holistic human perspective. And by that, we should and deserve to know more about each other's stories. What is the myth of absence? that black people, number one, were here at every stage and we participated in everything, that we weren't simply toiling in fields, we were resisting at every stage. Resistance during the Civil Rights Movement is how Bernard Kinsey and Shirley Pooler met at Florida A&M University. Well, you see this cute 17-year-old getting out of jail and it took a lot of courage to go down in Tallahassee in 1963, people were getting killed. And uh, I just thought uh, th that combination was pretty remarkable. Uh, so I wanted to meet him. After graduation, they got married and Bernard became one of America's first black park rangers. So we began to collect souvenirs at first. Actually, Native American stuff first yeah. because our first travel was from Los Angeles to the Grand Canyon. The <laughs> Grand Canyon. Right. I had never been there. So our, our first collecting really was, I've got Kachina dolls, I've got rugs, I've yeah. got sand, I've got all kind of stuff from these national parks. But once he became a big corporate executive at Xerox, their collection grew more nuanced. Ernie Barnes was one of the first pieces that we bought yeah, nice because his work always inspired us of growing up in the South. So what room is this? Well, this is where we keep the, all the good stuff. Inside their home, their own ancestry speaks volumes. This is my dad who I, Aww, I just adore. adore. Bernard's father was an educational changemaker in Florida. Shirley's grandmother, a silent protester through her sewing machine. Well, because when I was growing up, Mama said, we don't go to the store if you can't try on clothes. Mm. I'll make your clothes, and that's what she did. People began entrusting them with their family's possessions. This gentleman called him up and said he'd found this in his aunt's attic, and they hadn't, nobody had been up there since the 50s or whatever. And, and why to send it to him. And Bernard, I can remember you stood there opening I at the door be. and he was literally shaking. A bill of sale of a human being from 1832. I couldn't believe that somebody could own somebody. Now it's abstract when you read about it. It is different when you're holding this guy in your hand. That was a turning point when casual collectors became intentional curators. Another push came through an assignment for their son in elementary school. And he came home saying, well, mom, James can go all the way back to the Mayflower. 
and Jimmy can go all the way back to Paris. And we could say only we could go to Florida because we didn't know anything else beyond that. Um, I decided then that all of his reports were going to be about somebody black who did something to help America become America. From authors and thinkers like Phyllis Wheatley and Frederick Douglass to the man who ensured Washington, D.C. was built to spec, Benjamin Banneker. For nearly 20 years, the Kinseys have taken this show on the road from Hong Kong to Disney's Epcot Center to the Smithsonian and even a Super Bowl at SoFi Stadium. That's Shirley, that's Khalil Reed and Khalil Gibran, <laughs> yeah. and that's me. And I love this because he's got us looking toward the future. Everywhere the Kinsey Collection goes, it relays writings, inventions, and presence in all spaces linking past with present. This is Dr. Selma Burke. She uh, actually crafted the relief, sat with the, uh, President uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and the dime that we all still use today was created by this woman. Really? Yeah, and nobody absolutely. knows about it. The Kinseys are effectively changing that and encourage others to follow their path. This is a, a Pullman porter on the American railroad system. My great grandfather was a Pullman porter. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That's Aww, the thing. Baby. That's the thing. This, this, this history is in all of our homes, yes. in all of our lives. And what we're trying to do is illuminate this in so many ways, but also encourage others to do the same. And because it really is the fabric of our lives. Seeing that uniform really just transported me to you wonder got, you got about emotional. this. I really did. I, I, I don't want to get all into it without pointing out the Kinsey's have this remarkable book that details their entire collection. It is, as I said, more than a thousand pieces. It's fascinating. Mm. Michelle, that piece was fantastic in so many areas that you were able to show us of parts of the collection, how different it is. Really want to thank uh, Sierra Morris for helping me with this project, our producer, and our, both of our editors, um, uh, Kathy Landers <laughs> and Laura Fijersu. Yeah, it was wonderful. Ani Art Academies is where aspiring artists, many from impoverished areas, receive an education unlike any other in the world. Meg Oliver joins us now to take us inside the Dominican Republic School. Good morning, Meg. Good morning, Dana. The nonprofit program is not only teaching art, but changing the students' lives in ways they never could have imagined. With every stroke of charcoal, Patricia Alonso Diaz strives to tell a story through her art. It's the connection that the girl has with the nature, you know. Patricia spends 35 hours a week mastering her craft in an unexpected school. Tucked away in the hills of Rio San Juan and surrounded by a lush garden is Ani Art Academy. When you started, you could just draw lines? Yes, I and now used to this? do drawing, but just like simple lines, you know, without no means about light and shadows, and now I can do this. The Academy offers locals from impoverished areas a three-year art education <coughs> and daily lunch completely free of charge. I was like surprised to have this opportunity in this country, you know. It's all part of Ani Private Luxury Resorts, a collection of rare hideaways in some of the most beautiful and far-flung corners of the world from Anguilla and Thailand to Sri Lanka, and here in the Dominican Republic. The profits from the resorts are used to fund the schools. The resorts serve as galleries for the students. Some art selling for as much as five to $8,000. That commission is theirs to keep. Life-changing in a country where the minimum wage is less than $15 a day. More than 20% of Dominicans live in poverty. Unemployment rates have averaged 5.5% for the past decade. So I use three brushes for this exercise. Maxwell Miller is the Dean of Art at the Academy in the Dominican Republic. We start very simply from how to draw lines accurately. All of the schools teach the same Wachula's art curriculum. The program is based on deliberate practice and automaticity. What that means is that we're doing a lot of repetitions, 
through those repetitions, you end up learning this muscle memory so that you feel something, you hear perhaps the way that the, the pencil skitters across the page. And instead of thinking about how I can create these beautiful gradations, this incredible artwork, your hand does it for you. The simple one, which is essentially perfect. The brainchild behind the academies. Uh, hey bud, how you doing? Is Tim Reynolds, a wealthy investor and philanthropist from New Jersey. Yeah. I've always had this passion to earn enough to build schools. That desire to build schools transformed into art academies after he became a paraplegic in a car accident 25 years ago. You always wanted to give back. Well, I just feel really sad when I see how much suffering there is. Education is, is the best way, I think, to solve that. And art education is special. It's nice to meet you. After his accident, Reynolds hired art teacher Tim John for private lessons. Were your art classes a form of therapy for him? I, I believe so. I believe he was looking for something to pursue that he was passionate about that would allow him to spend a very long portion of his life pursuing that. A passion he wanted to share in poverty-stricken areas. There are now six academies all over the world. How are you changing their lives with this education? So all of our students, all of our graduates have some significant financial impact being here and studying here and the artwork that comes out of here. Everything from commissions to just doing finished work, selling them in galleries. In fact, one of our graduates, Frelo Lantigua, uh, has built his entire home. He is building it one piece at a time, specifically off of the sales of commissions. People ask me, you know, are you upset about income inequality? And my answer is not that much. But I'm really, really upset, like angry upset, about opportunity inequality. The apprentices need wonderful things on their resume. In addition to molding artists, academy teachers also want students to learn how to communicate through art. For me as a child, I didn't come from means. I was fortunate enough to work in a gallery that taught me how to communicate. How to communicate with people with wealth. And when I see my boys and girls, they don't know that. They don't realize how far of a chasm they have to go from where they are to where they need to be. At the Arte San Ramon Gallery, artwork from 16 students in the DR were on display in November, including this charcoal and pastel on paper by Patricia, titled Behind the Eyes. You have like a connection with the horse when you see it directly and comes to you. I don't know if you see if you feel it when you saw it, but that's the what I wanted to, to transmit. The 30-year-old married mom also works on the weekends to help her husband, a local fisherman, pay the bills. After graduation, she wants to teach art full time. Now that you're selling your artwork, how has it changed your life? Yes, it changed a lot because I have the opportunity to have the pace of my life. For example, my baby, a better life, my life too. I can help my parents too, my family. Uh, so it changed a lot for me. Reynolds hopes to continue changing lives through art for years to come. Everybody I know that was born in a developing country says to me like, hey, you know, you should build one of these in Cuba or Tanzania or, you know, whatever. It's like the demand is there. Are you just getting started? I'm just getting started. <laughs> but there's a lot, a lot I have to get better at. And, uh, and we are. There are only a few requirements to get in. Students must be 18 years old, highly committed to learning, and have citizenship in the region, but no portfolio is necessary. Some of the graduates become very successful. Kevin Lugo, for instance, from the DR Academy, painted on the Lost City movie set in 2022. Others have gone on to illustrate medical textbooks, and some even own art galleries in New York City. The idea that they can start knowing... Nothing. 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 And 35 hours a week. I mean, you have to be highly committed to this. A lot of these students are then working on the weekends to help right. support their families. But mm -hmm. seeing the difference that, as you said, one sale, mm -hmm. what that can make, $15 a day, the minimum wage there mm -hmm. average, unbelievable. Meg, really good story. 
They are often the last article of clothing we put on, but they're still a vital part of our wardrobe. And for the first time, annual global spending on shoes is expected to top $400 billion. Shoes are a statement of style, personality, and identity. And nowhere is that better showcased than the venue we visited just north of the border. This is a fan favorite for sure. It is a Louis Vuitton shoe trunk. Oh my God. And so if you were to go on a, say, jaunt around the world, this would be one of the trunks that you would take with you and just to hold your shoes. Oh my God. This 1920s shoe trunk is just one of an array of pieces on display at Toronto's Bada Shoe Museum, where Elizabeth Semelheck is the director and senior curator. Even if you give me a single pair of shoes, and you tell me I, that I need to research this. Yeah. Not only am I gonna look at its structure and think about the time period in which it was designed, but who designed it, who made it, who made the materials. There are so many lenses that you could apply to just a single pair of shoes. The museum was born out of the shoe collection of businesswoman and philanthropist Sonia Bada. It houses nearly 15,000 shoes and related artifacts that trace the evolution of footwear. Prior to industrialization, a shoemaker could only make a handful of shoes a week. And so that meant that shoes were expensive. So industrialization did many things. It sped up production. But as it sped up production, it also lowered price points. And gave rise to the celebrity shoe designer. In the 30s, designers take off. For example, Ferragamo makes the wedge heel in the 30s. The platform comes back in the 30s. The museum even considers the origin of a style staple for the well-heeled. At the end of the 30s, of course, World War II breaks out. And what are soldiers putting up in their barracks? Images of Varga girls wearing thin, thin heels. And so it should come as no surprise of course. that after World War II, yes. it is the stiletto that is invented. <gasps> One of the most famous shoe designers of the stiletto was Roger Vivier, and he was a shoe designer for Christian Dior, and this is one of his designs. It's beautiful, but by the way, does not even look high enough. Do you know what these are? The stiletto, as we know it today, stepped into pop culture. They don't fit, so help me, I'm gonna wear them anyway. And onto the screen in the long-running HBO series, Sex and the City. I do love the high heels with the, the crystals and the glimmer. But Actress Bridget Moynihan made her TV debut as Natasha on the show. Hi, it's a pleasure to meet you. I've heard so much about you. Where the designs of Jimmy Choo, Manolo Blahnik, and the like were more than just accessories. Now, the heels are almost high enough to put me face to face with Natasha. Helping spark a shoe fascination for Moynihan, which eventually blossomed into a book, Our Shoes, Ourselves. It started with emptying my closet and realizing that 99% of the shoes in my closet I never wear <laughs> and I can never wear again. Right. And I decided I was going to donate them and, and get rid of them. But as I was putting each pair into a box, I kept retaking them out because, well, this one had a special moment. Right. This was at, you know, some premiere or these pair were from Sex and the City or another pair was my trip to Africa with my mom. And so everyone had a memory attached to them. And that's why I was holding on to them. In the book, 40 accomplished women share memories related to the shoes that mean the most to them. We had an astronaut, a four-star general, mm -hmm. and a senator who was in Iraq. Yeah. If you earn those combat boots, it becomes like part of your core. It becomes part of your identity. Yeah. And I think that what was uh, a common thread was that everybody in, in their own way felt empowered by those shoes. Power derived from shoes is something that until recently had been reserved for men. Is it the short socks? No, Mars. Money's gotta be the shoes. Shoes, shoes, shoes. Shoe. While the idea of women collecting shoes has been subject to ridicule or dismissed as an indulgence. At the Bada Shoe Museum, that notion is being questioned. Why do we dismiss women and their shoe consumption as irrational and frivolous when in fact it's a multi-billion dollar business. Right. When you think about Air Jordans, Air Jordan 1, Air Jordan 2, Air Jordan 3, it creates a quote-unquote rational structure for collecting yeah. that mirrors 
other forms of men's collecting. The museum's recent sneaker collection even provided a way to go back to the future. The Nike mag was started its life as an idea and was a movie prop. So it was in the movie Back to the Future 2. Our laces, all right. And everybody went crazy. But it took until 2015 to find a battery that was small enough yet powerful enough to actually do auto lacing. Until the real time the movie was made. Yeah. <laughs> the future. Unbelievable. As for our future, that means considering sustainability in our footwear, with more than 20 billion pairs of shoes manufactured each year. One solution may be artificial leather made from mushrooms. You get a pattern for the latest design, you put your last in, you add some uh, fungus spores, a little bit of corn and a little bit of water and your shoe grows overnight, and then you can compost it at the end of the day. I think it's a brilliant idea. I'm looking into the future right yeah, now. Exactly. <laughs> it's amazing. Reminding us of the balancing act built into our shoes, no matter the material, size, or color. Is footwear function? or is it fashion? Or when did it change? Well, you know, I don't think footwear has ever just been function. Even the ability to afford shoes uh, automatically suggests status. And I think that if it was simply just protection, we would all be in flip-flops all summer long, and we're not. There's so much different choice. And so I think that the same impulses that we have within our current society of differentiating ourselves from one another, and doing part of that work through the, our footwear choice has been a part of that history of shoes going back to time immemorial. So a couple things I wanna say, 20 billion pairs of shoes manufactured each year, that's like two and a half per person on this planet. So think about that. And sometimes you don't even realize that you're making a statement with your shoes. Mine today, I didn't have Honolulu blue to wear for the lions. Who are you wearing? I'm wearing. I don't even remember who they are, but I'll tell you, it's the color. Is that what you say? This silver, this silver is for my lions. Okay. So yes. you make statements, whether anybody else realizes it or not, you can do that. I know. Michelle, what statement Michelle, are, you are you making? Wearing? I'm just saying. It, it, <laughs> you're saying I'm a badass, is what you're saying. <laughs> no, it really, it is amazing. You may not think about it, Elizabeth says, but as you're putting on a pair of shoes, throughout time, we always have made statements, whether we've meant to or not. Yeah, I just want to say there's no price tag on the bottom of this red That's box. good. <laughs> that, good. <laughs> that was cool. Tyler Thank nice. you. So yes. Them very much. Thank you for that. And Bridget's book, the she's co-author of, is really fascinating with each story that these women tell and the shoes that represent a story and a part of their life. You guys tell me before the show every week when we're taping yeah. headlines, I don't want to be wearing these heels. <sighs> no. I said, well, okay. If you don't want to wear That's them. not what we said. That, that we is don't have time to get for labor it's later. We're we going to have to All table. Right. The French fashion house Chanel is one of the most recognized brands in the world. Opening her first shop in 1910, its founder, designer Gabrielle Coco Chanel, has been credited with changing the way women dress forever. Now London's Victorian Albert Museum is holding a major sold-out retrospective on Chanel's life and designs. As Holly Williams found out, amid the style, the designer's life was one of massive contradictions, from Nazi collaboration and anti-Semitism to assisting the French resistance. Into the future. It's a name that for more than a century has been synonymous with glamour and celebrity with understated luxury. It's the height of chic for evening wear as a hostess or on the town. And above all, with French chic. Are you wearing the, Ch the Chanel boots? Yeah, I am. Mm -hmm. You look good. Even if you're not a fashionista, the designs of the House of Chanel have become so iconic, they may have entered your consciousness. The quilted handbag. Two-tone ballet flats. Chanel number five. Chanel number five. And the timeless tweed suit. We think of this as being very classic. It wasn't classic. This was new, right? Well, absolutely. And, and the interesting thing about the Chanel jacket, as you can see, it's always recognisably Chanel, but always slightly different. A new blockbuster show in London, Fashion Manifesto, goes back to Chanel's roots to show how the label revolutionised the way women dress. 
So this is, I'm guessing, the little black dress. You can see the central piece here. It dates from 1919, which is quite incredible because it's really something that could be worn today. The fact that you and I are both sitting here wearing trousers is thanks to Coco Chanel. Really? When she started designing, women were wearing long dresses, corsets, feathers. They were literally constrained by the clothes that they wore, and Chanel gave them freedom. Justine Picardy is a fashion historian who wrote a book about the woman behind the brand, the late Coco Chanel. Born into poverty in small-town France and sent to live in an orphanage run by nuns when her mother died, Coco Chanel went to work as a sempstress and as a cabaret singer, beginning a series of affairs with aristocratic men, including the Duke of Westminster. She wasn't respectable enough yes. for an aristocrat to marry. There's an apocryphal story that she said there have been many duchesses of Westminster, but only one Coco Chanel. What extraordinary self-possession to say something like that. She also had the courage to launch her own business at a time when the odds were stacked against her. When she started her career in 1909, 1910, women still didn't have the right to vote in France. They didn't get the right to vote until 1945. So to be a successful female entrepreneur was really unheard of. But Chanel's reputation has been tarnished by her romantic relationship with a German intelligence officer when France was occupied by the Nazis during the Second World War. She also tried to use Nazi laws to strip her Jewish business partners of their assets. Picardy believes Coco Chanel started the affair to get her nephew Andre out of a Nazi prisoner of war camp and says Andre may actually have been Chanel's son born out of wedlock. She's also uncovered evidence that Chanel, a friend of Winston Churchill, was secretly working for the French resistance against the Nazis. Was she an anti-Semite? As with so much of Chanel, she's complicated. I wouldn't want to be black and white about her. You know, she said some terrible things, but I can say, hands on heart, she was not a Nazi. Whatever the truth of Chanel's Nazi connections, her impact on fashion is unquestionable. After her death in 1971, the house she established lived on and has kept evolving. That famous logo, an entwined pair of C's, has branded everything from surfboards to motorbike helmets. There's always, uh, you know, the CC logo, complete, I mean, probably one of the most recognisable logos on the planet. You know, you look at CC and you see Chanel. It sounds like you're saying it's a kind of masterclass in branding. Coco Chanel was a, a sort of maestro in branding, like before the word brand even existed. Susie Lau is a fashion journalist and influencer. In recent years, she told us Chanel has found a massive new market in Asia, where it now earns more than half of its revenue. There'll be vintage shops in uh, Japan and Korea, which are just dedicated to Chanel, particularly rare items of Chanel. And the prices are like eye-watering. They would be three or four times what they were in the store. Does that mean that it's art? I think a lot of Chanel items do cross over into that art territory. A lot of them feel very much like objects rather than apparel. Coco Chanel's personal history is still being debated by historians, in stark contrast to the beautiful simplicity of her work. Just how complicated is her legacy? There's something very pure about her legacy in terms of the design. The language of Chanel, Coco Chanel, the designer, is very pure. It's, it's, it's not muddied at all, but the legacy of the woman is very complex. For CBS Saturday Morning, Holly Williams, London.
every single one of those dresses I would wear. I know. Every I was thinking that too. Right now. One. Right now. But what a great. And there's the complication. Yes. Because when you hear the question, was she an anti Semite? And yeah. the answer is, well, it's complicated. It's not really no. the answer. And it is hear. what she said at the end, though, that the person, that's muddied. And that, that part is something that you're going to continue to look at and say, this isn't good. But you look at the simplicity and the beauty of her dresses and the branding she created before it happened. It's unbelievable. Yeah. You yeah. Can't and yet, that. to your point, I don't own a single Chanel piece. Nor do I. Nor do I. Or a perfume. The sky's the limit and the brand new canvas for a new generation of artists. In cities across the country, fleets of flying drones are being used to create dazzling light shows with technology that is still evolving and improving. Jamie Yuka shows us how the eco-friendly entertainment is captivating creatives in Los Angeles and the audiences who see their work. From film buffs to casual fans, Cinespia at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery has been the place for movie magic for more than two decades. And on this night, before the big screen gets rolling, a different kind of show took center stage. This year we're gonna be doing some drones and a drone show after the movie. We're really excited. John Wyatt is the founder of Cinespia. So Cinespia was kind of innovative when it first started. Now mm. you have this innovation mm. coming. Is it kind of a match made in heaven? Yes, it's kind of perfect. It's almost the next chapter. It is. It's a new chapter, and I'm really, really excited to see what we do with it in the future. Cinespia would typically launch fireworks after showing a movie, but then came creative agency Heads in the Sky. The second we saw the drone show in real life, the second we saw the words light up and illuminate the night sky, we were like, this is the future of marketing. Yeah, this is right the future, from the takeoff. <laughs> the future of storytelling in the night sky. Kevin Prince and Michelle Retorto are the company's co-founders. They were the creative minds behind this year's surprise Grammy drone show. Truly, you know, the drone show that we worked on together was the aha moment for us of, wow, we are at the forefront of something <laughs> truly that is about to explode that nobody knows about. And seeing a drone show in real life is unlike seeing yeah. anything you've seen in the night sky before. Their belief in the technology is so strong that they became first time business owners forming one of the first creative drone show agencies in the U.S. But so that's, you have these steady careers and jobs, like why <laughs> this? Why not? <laughs> well, we figured the sky's the limit with these types of marketing shows, you know, we can get very creative in the stories that we want to tell. And so nobody's really doing that, I feel. So we wanted, you, to, we wanted to jump on the chance yeah, and we want to invest our time in it. And that's what they've been doing ever since with Cinespia being one of their first clients. When Heads in the Sky first came to you and said, we want to do a drone show, forget the fireworks, what did you think? I was like, yes, please. Oh, because really? I was. Their approach was very interesting to me because they saw a drone show as a little narrative and that narrative was going to have an emotional component. As soon as I heard that from them, I thought these people are on the same page. So I was like, let's do this. <laughs> Every show starts with a storyboard. So first you have your intro. And has a theme. Drone formation. The Cinespia theme this night, Harry Potter. Do people even know what they want? They want it all, to be honest. <laughs> so I say if you focus down onto one thing, do you want people to feel something? I think you can cry, I think you can laugh, I think you can be scared, I think it could be surprised. Um, there are a whole slew of emotions that can come from a drone show that is that are unexpected. Heads in the Sky works with a drone company to execute the show. It weighs about what? About two pounds. Is just two pounds, just even two with pounds the battery in it. With the battery in it. That's where Rick Boss, that's president of Sky show. Elements Drone Shows, helps out. Is this the star of the show? This is one of the stars in the show. We're actually going to have 300 stars in the show. So you multiply that by 300. Absolutely. We clone them. And no matter how many drones are in the sky, there's only one engineer flying them all. These drones don't deliver products or have cameras attached for filming. Their sole purpose is to dazzle with their LED lights. Audiences are mesmerized by patterns, shapes, and animations dancing in the dark. 
Sky Elements has done shows in Texas, creating giant sharks with 1,500 drones. I didn't even realize the two sharks would be this massive. And a tribute show to Kobe Bryant. MVP is none other than Kobe Bryant. How many can you go up to? So we've flown shows as high as 2,000 drones. Is that scary? It is a little bit, because when there's 2,000 drones in the sky, that means there's $5 million in the sky. So that can be a little scary. Oh, wow. Yes. That's a big number. It is a big number. Other light shows have also recently been displayed all over the world, in places like China showing off this dragon, and Dubai with a New Year's Eve show over the water. I think drone shows are going to become like skywriting at night. I think they're going to become as ubiquitous as <laughs> Skywriting is now during the day, but like on steroids. So it's, it's like kind of like you're going to be driving down the highway. And if you haven't seen a drone show in real life yet, mark my words, a year from now, you will have seen one. I mean, even this year, I feel like we've seen more than we've ever seen. And we'll likely continue to see even more with drones constantly evolving, enhancing the detail, making for bigger and better shows. It's just the beginning of the technology. And I think it's going to become something that's really, really creative and cool in the future. For CBS Saturday Morning, Jamie Yukis, Los Angeles. Just magic. We should get some for the studio. And like, and we can each have one and do little battles. I don't think we during have the commercial the break. We would. <laughs> do you think that would, I think it would work well. I don't. I no prospect so. for any damage, yeah. of course. Oh, no. That'd be no. great. <laughs> I would love it. <laughs>